Uh, oh yeah, we're recording. Uh, okay. uh, hey you and welcome. Um, my name is... My name is Mark. Uh, hey, uh, <laughs> Dennis. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> this... <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I was expecting that. Okay. <laughs> hey, listen, I, was, I always aim to the surprise. Uh, and in this old episode of the That Chapter podcast, I'm joined, uh, you heard his dulcet tones. His his name is Keith. Hey, uh, And he is a frequent uh, collaborator, co host, the other half. Well, I wouldn't say half, I'd say like 40%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being generous. You're being very generous. We'll, we'll, say, we'll say 30. We'll 30. say 30% yeah. of that chapter podcast. That's me and halfway, 35. All yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, all right. So, yeah, we're welcome back, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, you're, it's it's the Mike Zone. This is uh, the Mike Hour. And today, you know, I'm trying to do my shock jock mm-hmm. uh, routine. Uh, <laughs> dead babies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, what are, I don't, I haven't, I don't think I've ever listened to a shock shock. I barely listened to the radio in my entire life. Not, never really was a radio guy. I used to listen to the radio uh, when I worked, like in my many jobs. How many jobs have you had, Keith? Tell, tell us, tell us about your, your jobs you had before you doing your current current job. I don't want to tell the folks at home. You know, this is just for the fellas about what you're doing uh, in your day job, which is uh, I won't say, but you know, you got a reg- you got a regular job, yeah, white collar job. I've had many jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, let me think. We go uh, to deep dive into. The- let, me, let, me, let me try and get through real quick. Um, okay. So, but first, of all, I was a I was a glazer. A glazer. First, yeah. So like fitting glass and stuff. Okay. Uh, then I moved from that. I was I worked in a sweet shop. Nice. And uh, that was fun. Then I worked like as like in retail. Then I worked in a warehouse. First said sweet shop. Then I worked as an iron monger. Which is, you know, like fitting locks and hinges and doors and mm-hmm. door closed stuff. Did that for a while, like working in a warehouse and out on site, fitting stuff for construction sites. Then I uh, worked as a chocolatier. Then I worked in a shoe shop um, as a assistant manager. Then I worked in a jeweler's as mm-hmm. assistant manager. Then I went to recruitment mm-hmm. and then I worked in recruitment and now I'm in the job I'm in now. Very it's, good. It's on computers. I, so, work, I work on computers. So it was pretty much all like... Candy and iron, and pretty that much. Kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You always working with your hands. Fingers and many pies. Yeah, exactly. A lot of fingers <laughs> and a lot of chocolates. Very good. Uh, I'm trying to think about jobs I had before I kind of started doing YouTube and stuff like that. I started doing YouTube full time in 2019. Mm. Uh, I was actually that that year I was doing a year off because I was like I wanted to go back to college and because like, I fucking hated what I was doing in my career. So I went back to college. I was like, I'm taking a year off. And I'm going to upskill. I was doing like coding or some bullshit. Oh, yeah. I which remember, I also fucking I remember the course we're doing it. Yeah. yeah. I basically have hated every... I, I actually <laughs> hated every single job I've ever had until I started doing YouTube. Look, jobs are off. It's never going to catch up. Yeah. So, and then anyway, during that year off, I look, was lucky enough that YouTube took off for me. And so that's what I was in 2019 when I started taking YouTube seriously. And then I started treating it like a job. Blah, 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 blah. So it was actually kind of just lucky timing. But before that, I worked in retail... Uh, like a pharmacy. Oh, uh, yeah. I worked in P or for a couple of different P or agencies. I, I I did I w- studied like communications in college. I worked in P or agencies. I then got a master's degree in public relations, mm. and then I realized I fucking hated public relations, <laughs> and I never wanted to work in it again. <laughs> the public uh, sucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, no, it's just I realized it's so full of shit. Like, yeah, yeah. And then I worked for a airline company making videos. That was actually where my first experience oh, making yeah. videos was yeah. for was for an airline so making videos of planes exploding is pretty cool uh so yeah it's a very lazy bastard but then thankfully uh youtube took off and now i am working non-stop yeah it is true what they say like you know if you do what you love you'll never work a day in your life mm. that's not true at all <laughs> 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 work it, if you're doing what you love you yeah. will be working non-stop 365 yeah, seven yeah. days a week you yeah. are never not working yeah 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 uh but i do love what i do and mm. i'm never doing anything else mm. and i'm uh hashtag blessed <laughs> to be able to do what i to do what i to do what i do yeah so uh you know things worked out in the end they did yeah they worked it very well for you yeah. it worked out well for you they did yeah. worked out well for all of us yes i'm sure they worked all, out well for the listeners. we're all happy if they didn't i hope they do all right. How did we go so, on to that? What? How did we go on to that? I don't know. We were talking there for about eight minutes about jobs we had. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we're just talking with no idea of what's coming out of our mouths. That's true. Well, you know what? I'm going to say some words that aren't random mm-hmm. when we get into today's story. Today's topic is the case uh, of Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. It is a... 
Uh, for this one, we're going all the way back to the very end of 1997, if you can believe that, mm. to begin a legal saga that, despite having a suspect behind bars for more than 20 years, debate about what actually happened. It's running wild, with the most recent appeals being heard just last year. This case is insane. It's very debatable. Uh, me and Keith. We're even texting about it mm -hmm. before we covered it. Uh, he did his little research, finding different topics. This is a really, really interesting case. We're actually really excited to get into this one. And it's very reminiscent of the famous David Bain case, um, which is a case I covered on the podcast. Keith, you weren't on that one. Mm -hmm. But um, it's one of those ones where by the end, you'll be like, cover up or got the bastard. And it's also uh, set, much like David Bain, set in New Zealand, mate. What? So Yay. let's give it a go there now. Lord of the Rings country. Nice. Yeah. Hell yeah. Do, 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 do. All right. Let's do the Lord of the Rings <laughs> Yeah, so N to the Z, uh, Aotearoa, the real name for New Zealand. What is it? Uh, it's like Aotearoa. Oh, it's okay. uh, the Maori name for it. Oh, very cool. I didn't Do you know, know what? I'm... Mike's on again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're back. New Zealand flag. It's like the blue with the little Union Jack in the cover, and yeah. it's got red stars. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the Australian flag is like the exact same, yeah. but it has white stars. So it's like, first of all, Australia and New Zealand, get your fucking flags. <laughs> <laughs> like, you have the same flag. <laughs> a, this is your first problem. B, New Zealand almost changed their flag to like a way cooler flag with like yeah. a leaf. I, I'm sure there's probably some New Zealanders. Oh, listening. it was kind of like the. Like it's like, the the All Blacks. Yeah. yeah it it looks that was way it. cooler than yeah. their one. And they didn't vote. They didn't, the vote yeah. didn't go through. What are you so doing, listen, guys? That's my, that's my two cents there, folks. <laughs> get, a, get a better flag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so New Zealand, it's made up of two islands. And the action today takes place on the southwest of the southern one. The Marlborough Sounds are a mixture of stunning islands and peninsulas. And they attract people from all over the country. And even the world might. <laughs> it's especially... Okay, no, I can't do New Zealand accent. It's especially popular with recreational boaties and sailors looking to enjoy the climate and steady, predictable waters. It's full of people, sailors from all around, recreational sailors are all coming to this particular sound. Nice. My family had this speedboat, and we had a lot of fun out. Well, Keith, but why don't you just brag to the audience? We're already talking about you worked in a shopping shop. It's not a great brag. Like, we bought it for, like... Oh, I was like under two grand, but I'm it was like you have two grand to spend on a boat. <laughs> but we like we nicknamed it the the submarine because the, the what we nicknamed it we nicknamed it the submarine submarine because if you spent too long on the water on it it starts sinking <laughs> like if, wow. you're, if you're out on it for like forty minutes you'd have water up to your ankles like you had to come out the shore and uh, tow it out of the water know why it only cost two grand <laughs> yeah yeah but it was uh it was great it was, like we got three years we got three years out of the boat so it was that's a, pretty cool it was a reliable piece of shit hey that's what that's all in that's all about yeah. right yeah. it floated for a bit. That's I feel that could be the title of my autobiography. A reliable piece of shit. Reliable. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> That's good. So the area is also known nationally for its annual end of year celebrations and sometimes some of the raucous parties, ladies and gentlemen. It's a prime destination for young'uns looking to boogie into the new year with a few few scoops at Ferno Lodge, which is slap bang on prime real estate at the tippity top of Endeavour Inlet. Don't worry too much, too much about the names of these places, folks. Do remember for an Lodge, but Endeavour Inlet, Marlborough Sounds, it's just this really picturesque part of New Zealand by hmm. the coast. That's all you need to know. And they have really banging New Year's, New Year's Eve parties. Hmm. Back in the 1990s, the Lodge, for an Lodge, was a popular party venue. In the dying hours of 1997, the Lodge was host to huge celebrations that would end up being remembered for all the wrong reasons. So that's the where and the when. Now about the who. That'd be a good name for a band, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, well, there's a few important characters to get to know, but it all starts with two longtime friends, 21-year-old Ben Smart and 17-year-old Olivia Hope. Each separately were enjoying the celebrations before they would come together that night, just in time to play a tragic role in one of New Zealand's biggest mysteries. 21-year-old music-loving engineering student Ben lived in Blenheim, not far from the sounds. The first thing anyone had to say about him was uh, he always had a guitar with him everywhere he went, always happy to start a sing-along and raise spirits. He's one of those really annoying guys who brings mm. the guitar to a party and everybody's like, oh god, shut up. And now, here's Wonderwall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Ben Smart originally planned to finish out the new year staying over at a friend's beach hut with several other mates. We know then at some point that plan changed. Unfortunately, we're not sure when. 17-year-old Olivia Hope was primed and excited to begin studying for a degree in law at New Zealand's University of Otago, which is ranked in the top 1% of universities in the world. So mm. look at you. 
She was also very, very much passionate about music, something that her and Ben bonded over. They'd grown up being close, literally and figuratively, but it had become tighter over the years because of their shared passions. Olivia lived not far from Blenheim, in Grovetown, so the two were never that far away from one another. Olivia's family were pretty well known in the local area, as her dad was a politician, being the councillor for Marlborough. The Hope family were always close to, especially Olivia and her sister Amelia, who was also attending the same party as Olivia that very night. Olivia and several of her friends had chartered a yacht, the Tamarack, for the evening. The yacht had been their base before uh, they took a water taxi over to Bruno Lodge for the main gathering, you know, that very night. A gathering that had attracted over one and a half thousand people, by the way, so it was a pretty huge party this you know, New Year's Eve night, 1997. Ben himself had been drinking and partying at a different, smaller shindig, not that far away from Furneaux Lodge, but at some point he decided to head over to the big party and seek out his old friend Olivia. The two eventually met up and spent the first fresh hours of 1998 drinking and dancing, until finally they were shattered, ready to turn in on the wee hours of New Year's Day. What a life they have, huh? Like, it's so, yeah. it's so, it's so different than, uh, like, yachts and I know, parties rich and water taxis. Man. Yeah, I know, right? I like I think when I, when I was that age, I think I spent one New Year's Eve drinking cans in a wet field. So I think I was there with you. Or it was mm. one New Year's Eve. No, it was Christmas. Christmas Day. Oh, it was Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we we spent Christmas Day drinking cans in a field. Yeah, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Was it was cold. Was <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Olivia had paid for a bed on the Tamarack that night, but when herself and Ben got there, they found that someone had already taken the bed that was meant to be hers. She didn't have a, much of an argument as she did have Ben with her and other passengers point out, hey, you can't bring, just let your friends crash with us. Like he didn't pay for the bed. There's no room. At the end of it, the t- very, very tired at the stage, Ben and Olivia, they gave up. There was no room at the inn. They left the yacht to look for alternative accommodation that evening. And now this is where you better start paying attention, mm. folks, because this is where things get interesting. Listen to the facts. So Ben and Olivia, along with three other people, they took a small water taxi driven by a guy named Guy Wallace, who was a barman at Furneaux Lodge. And as I said, he was a barman, he doubled as a water taxi driver, so to make sure people got home safely after the party. Ben and Olivia, they asked Wallace if he knew of anywhere they could stay for the night. Unfortunately, Wallace told them they were shit out of luck. It was New Year's Eve and everything had been booked up for months and months and months, possibly even a year in advance. According to Guy Wallace and the other two passengers, Hayden Morrissey and Sarah Dyer. This is when the other passenger, the third man, he piped up and offered Ben and Olivia a a bed on his boat. After, you know, after a little humming and hawing, Ben and Olivia accepted this guy's offer. So this is the dun 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 moment. Hmm. A few minutes later, Guy Wallace dropped Ben, Olivia, and this other guy at the boat, at the host's boat. And Guy Wallace described the boat he dropped them off as, quote, a double-masted wooden hulled vessel, aka a ketch, around 12 meters long with copper portholes and fancy knotted rope work. The description of that boat is very important. Yeah. So put that in the old memory bank. Yeah, exactly. And it, for the description, it's important to know Guy Wallace, he worked at Forno Lodge, which is a popular area for boats, for mm. sailors. He doubled as a water taxi, so he knows his boat. So yeah. if he described a boat a particular way, I would very much trust his description mm. of the boat. Mm. So then three people got off, uh, Guy Wallace, and he took Morrissey and Dyer, who were the other two, two passengers, to their boat before turning in for the night. That journey would be the last time anyone ever saw or heard from Ben or Olivia. The alarm was raised pretty quickly when the two didn't return to the Tamarack the next morning. On Friday, January 2nd, 1998, the pair were reported missing by Olivia's father, Gerald Hope. Searchers were quickly in full swing looking for them. It wasn't like either of them to just disappear and not tell anyone where they were. The search was intensive, with police and volunteers combing the areas where the two were known to have been, and even divers checking various areas around the sounds in case there had been some kind of accident and they, they'd somehow like, ended up in the water. While the physical search was going on, detectives were busy working away in the background, trying to trace their movements throughout the evening before they mysteriously vanished. Eventually, their inquiries led them to Guy Wallace, who quite quickly realized that if the police didn't find a suspect soon, he might well become the target of their investigation. 
Guy Wallace is very straight up kind of a guy, and he was pretty forthcoming with what he knew. He told them, he told the police that, yep, he had definitely seen them and had taken them and the other three passengers as a last job of the evening and had dropped them off at their various destinations. It didn't take long at all to trace Morrissey and Dyer, and they too were very upfront with the police and confirmed everything Guy had told them. The third passenger, though, mm. the one that had ultimately departed with Ben and Olivia. Different kettle of fish. So despite having Guy, Morrissey, and Dyer all give very, very detailed descriptions of the man they were looking for, scruffy, thick stubble on his face, hair, it was a little bit longer, kind of messy, the police couldn't find them. Wallace had also given them a description of the boat where he had dropped the three of them off, yet police, they couldn't find that boat. Now, whether that was because they weren't exactly looking for it is a matter we will get to, but we do know the police never found the boat Guy Wallace described. Ghost ship. Ghost ship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what we also know is that Ben Smart and Olivia Hope got off the water taxi with this third guy and they were due to spend the night sleeping on his boat. They were never seen again. So who was this guy? Well, that, my friends, that's where the story gets very interesting. Mm. Because some people believe that guy. The mystery man. The mystery man was one Scott Watson. Scott Watson who was 26 years old at the time, was also at the Furneaux Lodge party that night. That's one of the few things he and the prosecution agreed on. To Watson, he attended the Furneaux Lodge party after already drinking heavily with friends on a charter boat named Mina Cornelia, arriving to the party late into the celebrations. He even appeared in photographs prior to coming ashore at Furneaux, which show how hammered he was, but his friends also, you know, it's also backing up his presence there. Also in the photos, he doesn't exactly look like how the other people described, mm. you know, the stubbly, long-haired guy. He doesn't look like that at all. So when he arrived at the lodge, the staff manning the entrance remembered him getting there, as he had a bottle of vodka with him, which they had told him essentially to ditch before he could enter, to which he happily complied by downing most of the bottle and tossing it away. Once inside, he danced and chatted charmingly with other revelers, which is according to him. To others, he was doing the old, well, this is, you gotta love the move, where he, he did the old drop his keys in order to look up girls' skirts move, and he's generally just making a dick of himself yeah. the entire night. Like, he wasn't, he was just the, the, the dickhead at the party. Yeah, yeah. That's how everybody describes him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was, like, he's remembered for that. Yeah. Which, like, we'll get into a little later. Yeah. He made an absolute prick of himself. Yeah. The whole night. Yeah. So we know he was still on shore at around 3 a.m. as he was involved in an altercation with another partygoer, an Oliver Perkins. They got into a fight, if you can believe it, after Watson made nasty comments about a beaded necklace this Oliver guy was wearing. The necklace in question belonged to Oliver's sister who was fighting cancer at the time. So after Watson laughed it off and made comments about his sister dying, uh, Oliver didn't take too kindly to that and, uh, well, started trying to beat the shit out of Scott Watson and then Bouncers intervened and they were separated. He just got like double down on it. it yeah, was, exactly. Oh, nice necklace, bro. I was like, oh, it's my sister. She's dying. Oh, fuck your sister. Loser. Yeah. <laughs> so from there, Watson says he doesn't even remember how he got back on board his own boat, Blade, where he lived, but he woke up on his own boat the very next morning. So for what it's worth, another water taxi driver, not Guy Wallace, our main one, he later said that he had taken a single male matching Watson's description back to Blade between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on January 1st, 1998. Watson says he then sailed Blade from Endeavour Inlet to Erie Bay on New Year's Day, arriving in the bay at around midday. So not only did another water taxi driver remember dropping off a single male on the Blade between 2 and 4 a.m., but some of the occupants on the two yachts the Blade was murdered up to gave evidence of being woken up by Mr. Watson in the early hours of the morning, and he, he was still looking to party. Basically, when he was dropped off, he was like, hey, yeah, yeah, let's, let's keep it going. Let's keep it going, let's keep drinking. Yeah. Um, the prosecution, this is where they, they, they bring in the, the two-trip theory. So they conceded that Watson, he, he had returned to the boat in the early hours of the morning alone, but after nobody wanted to party with him, and basically told him to feck off, they said that he went back to the Furno Lodge. So when Watson ended up on Wallace's water taxi later, this was actually his second trip back to the Blade he took that night. Yeah. Allegedly. Which is, that's what the prosecution claims he did, that he was drunk, he went back to his boat, and then he went back to the party 
and then met up with Derek Guy Wallace. So yeah, so I can hear you barking, big dog. <laughs> folks who are listening, like, what what's this got to do with Ben Smart and Olivia Hope? Why was he? Why am I talking about the prosecution? Why was he even arrested? Well, uh, I think we are we are asking ourselves that question too. Mm. In fact, a lot of people are asking why this doesn't sound like he had anything to do with the disappearance of Ben and Olivia. But uh, we'll get to it. Yeah, we will get to it. Like, there's no explanation of how he made the trip back. Yeah. Like, after he dropped off, like, how yeah. did he make it back? Like, yeah. they have, like, the speculation that he put his clothes in the bag and swam back. He was and hammered he fucking was, drunk. I know, yeah, It's yeah. like, it makes, none of this makes yeah, any yeah, sense. Yeah. He wouldn't have done it. It's all like, Nobody would have done like, that, yeah. yeah. So, regardless, Scott Watson was arrested on June 15th, 1998, on suspicion of murder, six months after the disappearance of Ben and Olivia. Investigators, and later the prosecution, alleged that Watson had actually been the fifth man on Guy Wallace's water taxi along with Ben, Olivia, Morrissey, and Dyer. So, a uh, couple of problems with that, but we'll get go through it all. For example, the small matter of Scott Watson being completely clean-shaven with his hair cropped short and tidy, as shown in photos taken with his friends before he got to Ferno Lodge, uh, very much hand-waved away by authorities. So, the mismatch between the man described by Wallace and the other witnesses that was further exemplified by a photo lineup that was astonishingly botched by the police. When the witnesses were shown a lineup of suspects, including a photo of Wallace clean shaven with short hair, they were all unable to pick out anyone from the list. When investigators then went away and later presented a new lineup, this time featuring a photo of Watson with long hair, unshaven, and which was kind of taken mid blink to give his eyes a droopy appearance, something which was pointed out as characteristic of this fifth man, well, wouldn't you just believe it? This time the witnesses all said that Watson could have been the fifth man on the boat. Yeah, look, one of the first descriptions of the mystery man given to police by Wallace, he said he was 5'8", tall, wiry build, his hair was a browny colour, wavy and sort of medium length, and he had about two days of growth on his face, and yeah. he was bourboned up so his eyes weren't focusing. Yeah. Um, so, like you said, the description Wallace gave it didn't really match what Watson looked like on that night at all. He was yeah. clean shaven, short hair. But it's really important to remember that, that Wallace, he was the key witness for the police. So it was really important to the police that they were able to get him to identify the suspect. Mm -hmm. Wallace, he said that when he went in to look at the photo lineup, he was told he had to choose someone yeah. in the lineup. Gun to your head. Yeah, yeah, you have to choose someone. This wasn't like saying is none of these is an option. Like you have to choose one, one of these from the lineup. He was presented. He said, for me, it was the hooded eye thing. And that was the only reason that he said yes to the photograph of Watson. Um, a bit of a side note, later Wallace said that uh, by the time he had seen the lineup, he'd already seen two photographs of Watson in the police station and also on television. So that may have made, yeah. made me sway him a little bit. It's like, yeah. oh, I've, I've kind of seen him beforehand. But yeah, he felt like tremendous pressure from the police and also the media during this investigation. Um, I'd say like part of it was like he was one of the last people to see Ben and Olivia. So like kind of what you said before, if, if it wasn't him, the finger was going to be pointed at him. That's why you might have been thinking. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So essentially, Scott Watson didn't look at all like the fifth person in the boat. The police were just doing everything they could to make sure that he fit the profile. The prosecution also argued that rather than arriving at Erie Bay uh, at around midday on New Year's Day, so the, the morning after the night before when they disappeared, the prosecution said he actually got there closer to 5 p.m., giving him plenty of time to set out to the Cook Strait to get rid of the bodies of Ben and Olivia, who the prosecution claimed were murdered on his boat. They even managed to get a witness to testify that Watson had arrived close to 5 p.m., something which the same witness later said wasn't right, and the police had lent on him as he had a weed-growing operation at the time, and, well, he knew they could make things really hard for him. So, the opinions uh, we've even mentioned with Guy Wallace, the opinion of witnesses changing under pressure, it's a bit of a recurring theme in this case. Yep. Watson's trial could be seen as the very definition of a trial by media. Authorities fed constant updates to the press, all designed to make Watson look as bad and as guilty as possible. Now, Watson, as we said, he seems like he was a dickhead. But a killer and a double killer, uh, I don't know, there's just no evidence to really support it if you look at this case any other like, way. So not only did the police seize Watson's boat, they made sure the whole thing was as public as possible. 
Though they didn't officially ID him into the media, they literally paraded his boat, a boat which Watson had custom built himself and was very obviously his boat, through the streets of his small hometown. Shockingly, he was immediately unofficially identified in the media, and the very public dragging of his character began. Papers were rife with every substantiated rumor you can think of, often with just enough truths thrown in that it was impossible to work out you know, what was what without extensive research. The most extreme rumors, which were complete bollocks, yet never refuted by public officials or representatives for investigators, alleged that Watson had, you know, for a long time been in an incestuous relationship with his sister. So basically 99% of what was written was besmirching his character, and yet didn't have anything to actually do with whether he was, whether or not he was guilty for what happened to Ben Smart and Olivia Hope and what had actually happened to them. Mm. You mentioned something there that was really interesting about Watson building the boat himself. This was something he was really proud of, and rightly so, like, he built a boat. Yeah. However, on the night Ben and Olivia disappeared, when they were on the water taxi, asking if there was somewhere to stay, the mystery man said that he could crash on their yacht. And two of the other witnesses on the boat remember Ben asking the man if he owned the boat, and he replied that he didn't, he was only crewing it. Mm. So, like, you'd feel like if he was asking, oh, do you own a boat? He'd be like, no, I made it. Yeah, you know, exactly. He'd, he'd be proud of it. I mean, Scott yeah. Watson says a kind of guy anyway that he would be boasting about this shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, like, mm. regardless. Yeah, yeah. So, to say Scott Watson made himself an easy target for the police, uh, it's pretty understated. Prior to being arrested on suspicion of murdering Ben and Olivia, Watson already had 48 convictions, with one for a violent offence. No, it's it's not like his contemporary behavior painted him in any better light either. Like it was because of how you know lecherous and drunk he is. Bit he was that's what made him stand out enough for people to remember him and and start to point him out to investigators when the initial you know investigation into the disappearance began. Thing is though, not only was only one of those convictions for a violent offense, but they were all for crimes Watson committed when he was under the age of eighteen years old. Far from being a hardened criminal, Watson was this bit of a shithead as a kid, shithead as an adult, but it seems he had turned things around and once he grew up he had a little contact with the police. So if Watson was planning on killing two people, would he really have gotten so drunk that he could barely stand and would make such a ruckus that so many people at a New Year's party would remember him? And if he really was that drunk, would he then you know, have been actually able to cover up a heinous double murder that left essentially zero evidence? behind even like if it wasn't planned if he randomly just did keep kill people it doesn't make any the case doesn't make any sense at all why mm. watson was even arrested to begin with i will say like with regards to his past he did go beyond like boys being boys and adolescent misbehavior so apart from stealing cars and burglary there was one story from watson when he was about 18 and he allegedly attempted to rape a girl at knife, oh. at knife point so the Jeez. girl said that Scott, he'd pushed her up against the wall at a party and pulled the knife out from his boot and waved it in front of her face. Uh, he said to come into the bedroom with him, but when she said no, he then held the knife to her throat and then asked again with, you know, a bit more implication. Luckily, one of our friends found her and before anything happened, and Scott backed away, but it just kind of shows what... Jeez Louise, yeah, that's piece pretty... Of shit he is. Yeah. Uh, and like, there's kind of, not as intense as this, but there's other sort of similar stories on how he treats women okay. uh, that had come from his friends and stuff. He says it's all taken out of context, but I don't like. He's a piece of shit. I don't like. Does that make you a murderer? Yes. It's no. Fuck you. Fuck you. I changed my mind completely on him. I never heard that story. <laughs> fuck Scott Watson. He killed him. Yeah. He, like, he, like he is an asshole. Um, yeah. And there is like there's other questionable things that he done, which are a bit strange. Like the day after they went missing, so like on New Year's Day, he did some suspicious things. One of which was like suspicious AF was. He left super early on New Year's Day to get to Erie Bay, yeah. which you're mentioning. Which he, he says he got there at midday. The prosecution says he got there at like 5 p.m. Yeah, yeah. But when he set off, what, what, what they reckon he set off, like they reckon he's left before 6 a.m. Mm. So like he'd only gotten back to his boat between 2 and 4. Mm. Pissed drunk after like 12, yeah. 12 hours of drinking. And then... Only got, what, like two hours of sleep? Yeah, he's and magically then, then wide awake, able to sail a boat, which I've never, I don't know anything about sailing, but I imagine you you can't be like pulling over to shit. Not easy, yeah. Because like sailing. And he was also, he was super quiet about it. So he left unnoticed by the other yachts that he had been rafted to. Yeah. So, and he doesn't seem like, considering how much of a menace he was the night before to people, he doesn't really seem the considerate type to yeah. 
leave nice and quiet so as not to wake anyone. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. Like, this is why there's a lot of like there's arguments for and against him, but then there's these sort of things about his character. I'm just like and suspicious things he does. I'm like, hmm. Yeah. It's a bit, bit strange. Why yeah. He, why, why he done that? Like, but we'll kind of get into a bit more as we go on. But well, that's, uh, this yeah. is weird. This is wacky laducey, oh my brother. The lead investigator, Inspector Rob Pope, once described Watson as, quote, sticking out like a dog's bows, <laughs> which shows Watson was very much in his bad books right from the start. Whether he was guilty or not didn't really seem to matter at times at all. The one piece of physical evidence presented by the prosecution should have been pretty damning, right? So <laughs> at this point, it's varying timelines and some witnesses who seemed like they were pressured into pointing out that Scott Watson was the last person seen with them. When it doesn't seem like he was the last person, but yeah. the police just lent on witnesses to mm. say he was. So this is the, this should be the killer, right? Is ooh, physical evidence mm. tying him to the double murder, possibly. They were two hairs, right? One around 15 centimeters and the other around 25 centimeters in length. Both were a dirty blonde color and they were found on a blanket on board Blade, which is Scott Watson's boat. And they were a positive match to samples taken from Olivia Hope's hairbrush. So that put Olivia on Blade, despite Scott insisting that they had never met and he had never seen her. However, <laughs> what should have been a solid piece of evidence, though also should have been completely invalidated by the investigators themselves, because not only was it discovered that the first time the blanket had been checked for evidence, only short dark hairs were found, right? Like Scott's hairs. Then magically two blonde hairs were found on a second inspection. So that's weird. And then secondly, it was the blanket in question had been kept on the same table as an evidence bag containing the sample hairs from Olivia's hairbrush. So to add more even shit to that, the evidence bag that had the hairs also had a big hole in it. So it was all contaminated evidence. The, the forensic technicians also neglected to count how many sample hairs they had collected. So it was completely impossible to say whether or not there was any missing. And if they had counted them, that would have cancelled their claims of cross-contamination. So basically they had two pieces of evidence mm. on the same table and it was just got all mixed up. And that's probably how the hairs yeah. got there. Well, the, so the blanket and the hairbrush, they weren't only just kept on the same table. They'd been examined by the same scientist on the same day on the same table. Yeah. So, like, I'm not sure what the correct process is for that forensics, but it, a bit, it can't uh, be that. Yeah, exactly. So it seems very easily that hair is just... Yeah, that's asking for cross-contamination. Yeah, 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 yeah. So instead of admitting the monumental errors in the chain of custody and handling of the crucial evidence and then having it removed from the list of exhibits, the prosecution, they were like, fuck, sure, we're going to use it anyway. Why not? <laughs> they even made it a focus of their arguments, insisting that it was all, it was all kosher, it was all above board, and no mistakes had been made. The defense did raise concerns, of course, but as Watson later pointed out, this trial lasted two and a half months with the prosecution's closing argument taking up 30,000 words by itself. So essentially, they just exhausted the jury. That mm. was their, that was the prosecution's plan. We'll just tire out the jury so eventually they'll say, yeah, he's guilty, whatever. Yeah. We just want to go home. Not only did the closing arguments have 30,000 words, they also had 500 witnesses. Over 500. The, 500. Wow. Well, there was the, like, what, 1,500 people at the party, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, over the course of like the 11 weeks. So it's basically like the prosecution, they just filibustered the minds of the jury. Yeah, just, yeah, exactly, yeah. So essentially by the time, after two and a half months of past, the jury was just like, I, don't I can't remember <laughs> anything because yeah. it's been going on for so long. Mm. So they would have forgotten so much testimony, so much evidence, and they just probably just all wanted to go home. Yeah. Wanted this to be over as quickly as possible. Guilty. Mm. Let's go home. And the hair evidence is only one of many pieces of flawed evidence and testimony from the prosecution. See, the prosecution also called two unidentified witnesses to the stand. Both were only ID'd as prisoners serving time with Watson, and both of them had similar stories to tell. According to them, they'd both separately heard confessions from Watson, in which he claimed, you know, he admitted to killing Ben and Olivia. Now, we don't really need to get into the whole issue with relying on jailhouse snitches, especially when they have complete anonymity and are receiving preferable treatment because of their testimony. And since the trial, one of the inmates openly recanted his testimony, saying he felt pressured into telling investigators what they wanted to hear. He'd also said that the period of October 1998 leading up to the trial, police had visited him at least 10 times. 
10 that, times. That, that wow, seems, that seems a like a lot, times. isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. They were really sure. I mean, that's sure. Every bit of this case is so stupid, though. It's like yeah. they only got Watson as a suspect in the first place because everybody just essentially he was probably just a name that just kept coming up. It was like he was, he, he was a drunk. He was yeah. drunk and acting like a dickhead. Mm, yeah, yeah. And then they were just like, oh, my God, mm. like, it's so stupid. So, of course, Guy Wallace was considered the prosecution's main witness. And even though he spent several months insisting that Watson was not the man he had dropped Ben and Olivia off with, somehow, magically, by the time the trial came, he had done a 180, and he was now testifying that Watson was this mystery man. In the years after, Wallace would once again reverse this, saying that not only did he feel pressured by the police to identify Watson, he also felt like if they weren't going to go after Watson, they'd be coming for him instead. So he was obviously desperate to say it was anybody else mm. to point things away from him. And the biggest, one of the biggest points of contention was Guy Wallace's description of the boat, which if you'll remember, we mentioned at the start. You'll remember Guy described the boat as being a catch or a double masted boat with a wooden hull, fancy rope knots and copper portholes. Watson's boat blade had none of that. His boat did not look like that at all. And as I even said this earlier on, is that Guy Wallace, he was around boats his entire life. Mm. He worked at a big bar that was at the docks. He drove a water taxi. He, if he, he would know a boat. He, mm. If he yeah. said something was a catch, you would believe him. Mm. He knows what he's talking about. Scott Watson's boat blade, it's a single masted wooden hulled sloop without portholes. As I said, Wallace Boater himself, he was around boats every day. He knew the difference between a catch and a sloop. So a catch has two masts yeah. and a sloop has one mast, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And Scott Watson had one, whereas this mystery boat had two masts. So investigators argued, however, though it was dark and he could have been mistaken, to which Wallace politely said, bollocks. In spite of Wallace's detailed description of the boat they should be looking for, authorities instead seized Scott Watson's boat and then very publicly towed it into custody. There are many people who've come forward over the years since and said that they recalled seeing a double-masted catch in the area at the time, with one witness even saying that it had stood out to them as they had seen a young man and a woman on board and had been surprised because they'd waved to the couple but hadn't received a wave back, which apparently in a sailing boaty culture, very uncouth, mm. very, uh, you know, barbaric and, and quite unusual in uh, this kind of culture. Regardless, there is no evidence to say authorities ever looked for a mystery catch, as it became known. So, just to briefly play devil's advocate. Yeah. So, Wallace's account of the catch was at around 4am in the pitch black. I actually, I looked up the lunar phase for January 1st, 1998 in New Zealand. And it said that there was a waxing crescent moon, which basically means that there was like the tiniest illumination from the moon. So visibility would have been really poor. So I guess it is possible that the second mast of the catch he saw could have been a single mast from a ship behind it. Like the bay was full, so the skyline would have been like filled yeah. with, with, with masts. However, in saying that, I personally still feel that it was this mystery catch. Yeah. Um, I said like a number of people came forward who spotted the double-masted catch in the area at the time. 54 reports, in fact, over, wow. like, from credible locals. Yeah. Um, also, Wallace, he stated that he was confused about the position of the catch that he gave police. So he'd been dropping so many people around that night on his water taxi, yeah. going to different boats that he, he got confused about the locations. So the police, they, they were looking in the wrong area mm. as well. Uh, annoyingly, a former police officer who was part of the op Operation TAM said that we were told by uh, Detective Inspector Pope that the catch sightings were going to be ignored and no investigations were going to be made into the sightings. He went on to say that police had shifted their focus of the investigation to Mr. Watson, who was at that time their prime suspect. So, yeah, um, I mean, so they had Scott Watson as their man Almost immediately. Pretty much, yeah. Just because he was so memorably making an ass of himself at the that party. That was it, yeah. Like, he was making so an ass, and then they kind of, as he looked into him, it, it, it was a name that kind of came up again and again. Like, the yeah. questions they were asked, like, I guess would have been, is there anyone that stood out? Any, any suspicious any characters? Any suspicious characters? Everybody and, said, said Scott. Yeah, he was going around taking upskirts of, yeah. of girls. Like, of They're course he was. Like, dropping over their dead sister, sorry. sisters yeah. and shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, of course, his name came up again and again. And then when they looked up his record, like, oh, shit, he has a police record. Yeah. They, they were just like... They zoned in. And yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. That, that's got to be him. So mm. they just ignored everything else and just like tunnel visioned. Even in his name, like, Blade. What do you use to stab right? people with? A, a knife. <laughs> <laughs> it all fits together. <laughs>
Watson has said in interviews that when people around him heard the arguments on either side, they were all sure he'd be getting out of jail and he'd be going home very, very soon. The prison guards were even so convinced that he'd be going home on the day of the verdict, they even brought in his civvies to be ready for him and so, you know, he could get changed almost as soon as they rang in the not guilty verdict. But of course, as you probably uh, guessed, dear listener, that's not exactly what happened. Watson was found guilty and slammed with a life sentence with a 17-year minimum non-parole period. Not only did that land him in prison for most of his life, it also left him with little hope of ever getting out. You see, to qualify for parole uh, in New Zealand and maybe other countries, a key component is for the offender to admit guilt and show remorse. But of course, Scott Watson insists to this day that he did not kill Ben and Olivia. Ben and Olivia, their bodies have never been found, and they likely never will be. To this day, all these decades later, no one knows what happened to Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. Scott Watson, he's appealed several times since, since his, his sentencing, and from his first attempt at appeal the year after his conviction to most recent being just last year, he has struggled to have his case reheard, even resorting to, to seeking a royal pardon in 2009, only to have to wait four years to hear it had been turned down. See, the biggest hindrance in getting himself a new trial is the lack of new evidence. Because the errors with the one piece of physical evidence were heard at the first trial, therefore, because they were heard, they can't be entered as new evidence to warrant a, a new trial, as well as the procedural errors uh, with the investigation. The errors were with the investigation, not with the legal side, so that doesn't qualify for a retrial either. That means that unless Scott Watson says he's guilty, whether he is or not, he is stuck in a New Zealand prison for a long time to come. You would think that if he was guilty, it just seems like the kind of person he is, that he would admit it mm. just to get out earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he doesn't seem like a good guy. So yeah. he, think like he, he probably would have be... been up by now, yeah. He would, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, what? it was in. I think he was sentenced in 1999 yeah. was when he was sentenced. Yeah, so that's 25 years ago. Yeah, he yeah. would be out by now. He would be out, yeah. If he did murder and said he was guilty. Mm. But he hasn't. And he seems like a piece of shit. Yeah, it's like why, this why, case... why wouldn't he? Yeah. yeah. His time in prison hasn't exactly been uneventful. He's been in involved in assaults of other inmates as well during that time. Um, but there you have it. That is the... It's such a frustrating case. That's But that's the story of the disappearance of Ben and uh, Olivia Hope. That's the that's the story of it, folks. Uh, very frustrating case. It, it was an absolute mess. Like, eyewitness accounts are so flawed at the best of times. However, like, this whole case was... It was built around it, where police, they just seemed to, like, pick and choose what they wanted to fit yeah. their own narrative. A really good example of this is why did the police decide that Wallace's description of the vessel being a catch was so unreliable that they just completely disregarded it and focused entirely on a different type of boat. However, the position of the vessel he gave was so set in stone that it led him to Watson's boat, the blade, which was a sloop. Like, that doesn't make yeah. any sense. They, like, he, yeah. he gave testimony, they took half and goes, that's absolutely correct, that's set in stone, that's yeah. it. And then the second part where it was like, it didn't, Ooh, it didn't match up, it's like, oh, no, 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 that that's now. unreliable, that's oh, unreliable. I think you're, yeah, I think you're making, you're making it up now. Yeah, like the case against Watson, it was just completely circumstantial, as you were mentioning. Yeah. The, the blonde hair was, that was the only piece of evidence placing Olivia Hope on the blade, and, and that was bullshit. Like, yeah, that was clearly, like, it's not even, circum this is less than circumstantial. Yeah, yeah, This yeah. is like... Like, there's, it's, there's almost nothing here pointing towards Scott Watson as being the the perpetrator. Yeah, apart, apart from, like, his character. Yeah. But, again, like, like, honestly, like, I don't know if he did it or not, uh, but, like, I've read arguments on both sides. Yeah. He did some weird, questionable things and his character oh, he's, and stuff. Don't get me wrong, he seems like an asshole, like a piece yeah. of shit. Yeah, but yeah. I, But, you know... One thing I can't say for certain, though, is he didn't get a fair trial. Oh, for sure. Yeah, didn't get it. And nothing was fair regarding mm. this. I mean, and again, there was 1,500 people there at the party. Like, that's a hell of a lot of people for one party. So, yeah. I mean, there's probably a lot of shady characters there. Probably some, statistically, there was probably some murderers there. Yeah, if you're yeah, looking yeah. at, like, there's that many people there. Um, But yeah, and it's really just so it's a bizarre mystery and sad of what happened to Ben and Olivia. It's awful. Like, yeah, they've yeah. never been found. No one ever knows. What, nobody knows if it wasn't Scott. Let's assume we're, it, Scott is innocent. Yeah. I'm kind of still under impression yeah, that he's yeah. innocent. So who was that mystery man? 
on the water taxi with uh, the two girls, Ben, Olivia, and Guy. Who was that man? Who was the? What was the boat they got on? Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, just so many. And here's the saddest part: is just like so many unanswered questions mm. for the family. Olivia's dad, Gerald Hope, uh, he'd, he'd been the spokesman for both the Smart and Hope families throughout the years. Yeah. Uh, so he said, "What we got was conviction, but we never got the truth." And yeah. that's oh wow, that. he even he doesn't believe Scott Watson killed his daughter. But, well, even if he did, like the, he, they still haven't got the full truth out. Yeah, like, yeah. He, he actually went to see him. Okay. And just kind of if he did do it like he wants he wants a story he wanted to find yeah. out like if he did do it where are the bodies he yeah. wants they're just looking for the truth to come out yeah. so I don't know if he completely believes him or not um, they haven't got the full truth of yeah. what, what happened that, that night you know mm. so yeah it's sad yeah. yeah exactly I mean I guess you know maybe somebody was on that taxi that night he wanted to I don't know hook up with Olivia or something and mm. so invite him back to his boat and then kill them yeah like there's kill, a couple and then dump their bodies out in the ocean yeah like there's a couple of mad theories out there uh, really what are some theories let's get into theories let's get into theories uh, well like, there's some of them saying that like it was to do with like uh, drug smuggling or mm. like human trafficking or but it, it could have just been someone who was up, like opportunistic. Opportun- I, probably, yeah. I think that's what it is. Someone who arrived at the party and in like it could have been in in in, in a catch. Like they seen the catch a couple of days after with people on the boat. As I said, like that looked like Ben and Olivia. Yeah, witness said. Yeah, said that they weren't waving. One of the reasons could have been their hands tied behind their back. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, if he could have brought them back, could be more people on the boat. Like it, there was there's a number of theories out there. I don't think we'll ever find out what the truth is. And, and like that's the thing as well. The police, they were really frugal with like the information that they were giving out to the public, which really pissed everyone off because mm. the little bits of information that they did end up giving out, people just speculated on it, which made right. up these wild theories. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. these theories got traction from, and they weren't doing anything to dismiss these theories. So there's so much information out there that like you don't know what's true and what's not. Yeah. 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 Well... <sighs> There you have it, there folks. That's the story of uh, Ben, Smart, Olivia Hope, and mm. Scott Watson. Whether what the real story is, we do not know. Maybe we will never know. The only way you'll ever really figure out what happens is if somebody comes forward or if uh, the bodies of Ben and Olivia are ever found, which mm. I don't think it will be. 25 years later, they're at the bottom of the New Zealand ocean. Yeah, yeah. Something like that, unfortunately. Uh, what a bummer, you know. Yeah. Boo and Scott. Absolutely, yeah. Talk about bringing us down. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Way to bring down the vibe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, me and Keith both appreciate it mm-hmm. a lot. Uh, you will hear from us pretty soon in about, well, be, I would say a week, but God only knows when you're listening to this, so maybe it'll be even sooner. Mm. Um, but yeah, new episode out every single Monday, so please give it a go wherever you get your podcasts on all podcast platforms. And yep, check out the YouTube videos on that chapter. Uh, new videos out every Tuesday and pretty much every Friday too. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Correct. Okay. Well, the, hey, listen, he knocked it out of the park <laughs> with his final word yet again. Oh, you want a final word? Well, I was hoping for it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, the I, audience were hoping for it. Okay. My, my final word on this, I guess, if... Look, if you're, at, if you're at a party, just don't be a prick because yeah. you could end up on the suspect list. Exactly. So don't look up girls' skirts because you could end up on a suspect list for murder. That's, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, exactly the, that's the only reason. Yeah. That's, exa- I'm just, that's what you said. That's your words. Uh, all right. Thanks, and guys. they could twist it like that. End of the podcast. End of the podcast. <laughs> Kick her out of the bed right there and then just like, ah, oh, it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> like, throw your child off of it. <laughs> they, don't, they, don't, they don't care. Disgusting. No